Um, good morning. So my name is uh, Michael Welling, and I will be doing a presentation about I squared C and SPI, both in kernel and user space. So it'll be a presentation about the various interfaces used for those two peripheral interfaces. Um, I'm going to break it down into two separate slide sessions. And the first one will be I squared C. OK, so for I squared C, we're going to first kind of discover I squared C if you don't know what it is. Uh, we're going to have some example devices. These will tell you what is and isn't the I squared C. Um, then we'll go through the protocol a little bit. And then we'll start talking about the Linux subsystem, uh, Linux I squared C drivers, both on the controller and device. Um, I think that the use of the term slave is going to be used in this presentation. And um, there has been some re recent controversy over that. So I'll, I'll talk about that when we get, especially when we get to SBI. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about I squared C devices, instantiating them in the um, device tree um, and peripheral or um, platform devices. So after that, I'll do the I'll look at the use uh, user space tools, and then I'll go into a demo. Okay. So I squared C stands for inner integrated circuit. It's kind of a mouthful. That's probably why they called it I squared C. Um, it was first developed by Philips in 1982, um, usually for sensors. Uh, now it's currently owned by NXP. Uh, synchronous multi-master, multi-slave. So those terms, again, kind of loaded. Um, it means that the the you can have multiple controllers on the bus at any one given time and they can multiple devices can in it and start the interaction on the bus uh, typically though there is a single host controller and then you have multiple peripherals um, it's a half duplex uh, duplex protocol so that means you can only communicate in one direction or at one direction at a time because there's only a single data line open drain means that it it only uh, the lines are only driven down they uh, the, the passive state is driven uh, with a pull-up resistor which you'll see here these are there's little RPs there um, and then there's yeah only two wires pretty straightforward and we have a link for the Wikipedia if you want to get into it a little further um, so there are a couple of addressing modes since the bus is actually communicating the address in the first part of the protocol you'll see that in the upcoming upcoming slides there's a, a number of bits that are used for the address um, seven is the t is the original spec uh, then they moved on uh, and added a higher um, a number of addressing bits further on in the spec, but you usually don't use that. You end up usually using 7-bit addressing. Uh, there's a, a couple of versions. Uh, the two most common are the 100 kilohertz, which is the original spec, and fast mode, which is uh, 400K. There are faster modes, but they aren't used as commonly because most of the interface devices are um, sensors, low data rate. Okay. And then uh, IBM, or not IBM, Intel came up with the SM bus, um, which is a, a subset of I squared C, which is used for motherboard control and sensors. Um, it has a little bit of stricter tolerances on the voltage levels and timing and it has optional software level address resolution protocol um, we won't get into that much but it's 
pretty much I squared C as well. So if you see that term, you can use the I squared C drivers on that and I squared C devices. Um, here are some example devices that you'd see out in the world. We have so like real time clock, EEPROM, uh, converters, sensors. Uh, microcontrollers are a special case. Um, you can make the microcontroller the either a host or a peripheral. So that kind of makes them so that they can do either. Um, but yeah. And uh, touchscreen controllers, uh, GPIO controllers, there's a lot of different things. All right, so here's some example hardware um, for the electronics nerd in the, in the crowd. Um, we have, uh, this is an accelerometer gyroscope, IMU. So this is actually on the hardware that I'm gonna do the demos on. So I got the hardware here. Um, that's the Bacon Bits Cape, uh, which I designed. Um, so you'll see that there's pull-up lines on the I squared C, and that's because of the open drain protocol. Um, and this is a this other guy here is a, a servo controller. It was on a robotics uh, mezzanine that I created. Um, but then again, you see those pull-ups. Uh, the bus is usually shared a bunch of uh, amongst a bunch of devices, but uh, you don't need the pull-ups on each one. You just need it one time on the bus and it's usually 4.7K. It can go lower if you have a higher speed bus. All right, so here we're gonna look at the I squared C protocol. Uh, the, the important thing about this protocol is kind of understanding how the, the, the transaction starts, uh, the addressing, and then read, write, and then the data that comes across and there's acknowledgement bits and the acknowledgement bits will tell you the to the bus oh okay the device is there you can start talking to it or it can start talking to you depending on whether you set the read or write bit so uh when you when the bus starts the transaction it'll it'll lower these the sda and scl in a very specific sequence and you can see that the blue highlighted area here that the sda will transition low followed by the SCL transitioning low and that signifies the start of transmission. And then it's a synchronous protocol. So you'll see the address lines come through and then you'll have a clock for each address bit, it'll clock. And then you'll read write, which will tell the device you're talking to whether it wants to read or write and acknowledgement bit and if the if the acknowledgement is, bit is uh set then it will send the the data byte that you want to send across uh, or bytes it's it can be multiple bytes uh, usually it is and a lot of the times the there's an internal register address as well as the device address which is easy to confuse this address, the first address is the device address on the bus. And then there are gonna there will be, you know, internal register addresses that'll go into the data lines here, and then you'll have the read and write data is further down in the transaction. Um, so that's pretty much how the I squared C transaction kind of looks. Okay, so let's get into the I squared C um, subsystem a little bit. Uh, I like to do a little history, um, but I'm, I don't want to even guess at the pronunciation of the name. So I'm just going to let the, let you guys read. <laughs> I, I have a tendency to, to murder people's names. Um, but yeah, the, the, there's not been a whole lot of changes in terms of internal structure since the the development of um, the device model. It's its pretty steady or stable um, subsystem. Okay, 
So here's a here's a block diagram of the of the subsystem, which gives, kind of gives you a, a, an idea of how everything works internally. Um, I squared C core is kind of like the kind of like the center of the of it all, and the core driver talks to um, uh, the the bus drivers, which will talk to uh, the client drivers. And that will be what communicates with the user space. Um, the algorithm, which is part of what communicates down to the hardware and the adapter will use, be used together to implement the controller specific device driver. And all of like the majority of the work for a user will happen in the client drivers. Uh, but I will cover uh, bus drivers as well, uh, briefly. Okay, so if you're if you're going to start doing I squared C development at the level of host drivers, then you want to probably join the mailing list. Um, this is fun to watch sometimes, but this is one of those core subsystems that's used by a lot of other subsystems. So there's a lot of activity um, on the other subsystems. This one only happens when you add a new host driver. And I could imagine there can be more activity on this as new like RISC-V implementations add their I2C controller. Same goes for SBI. All right, so the bus drivers, so the this is the, the controller uh, side. So this is what is register mapped to the main SOC or system on chip. And that's going to help drive the lines to the, to the, to the bus. Um, there's an algorithm which contains general code for the class of adapters, and then the adapters kind of one driver for that. And if you want to uh, get a little more information, this is actually grafted from the I squared C documentation. Um, and I'm, I might actually show you a driver so you can kind of get a, a solid understanding of this is just parts of the uh, uh, host driver or bus driver. Um, so first thing you want to do if you if you're creating a bus driver is you define and allocate private data with a uh, I squared C adapter struct, and that struct has it has fields that you want to fill out while you're initializing the device. There's um, an algorithm struct as well, so that will tell you okay, these are the callback functions that will be used to drive the the transfer with the hardware. And then the adapter will have the, the algorithm and the private data for the algorithm. And then the set of uh, I squared C set adapter data will be used for that. And then once you have everything filled into that struct, you add the adapter. Um, there are some more details, but you if you if you are interested in this, there's probably a bit more documentation out in the uh, kernel docs. Uh, all right, so then once um, you have that core driver, you need to connect devices to the external, and then you have what are called device drivers. Um, the documentation actually, uh, this is copied straight from the documentation, a driver driver. Um, yeah, I, I didn't come up with it, so. Uh, it's just a way of saying, okay, um, you have each tech device gets its own data and the, uh, in the client structure. Uh, and I think this will be uh, more clear as, as we go on through the next set of slides. Okay. So here's um, kind of the basic starting point for uh, device drivers, so you have this I squared C struct, and then you have a driver and OF 
match table. Now this this is going to be for device tree. So you'll have a table that lists all the de compatible devices that will be attached to the driver. ID table, which is another table for matching. Um, you have a probe function and a remove function. Uh, there are other uh, fields in this struct, but these are the basics. Okay, so you'll see I have um, an ID table here. So this is just very basic, you know, example. So you can see how it works. Um, and it's the foo bar stuff. But yes, when you want to add the uh, the module device table, you just do that. And then if you want to add a device tree uh, compatible string for your specific device, then you do this second one here. And they both use the module uh, device table uh, macro to instantiate. Okay, that, I don't know if this is going to be too small to read, but this is an example probe function. Um, it's not a very good one, but it's it just shows you that it's a that's what the function pointer that you pass to the struct, and then you can do some basic initialization on the device. Uh, that's the the I squared C SM bus read data is kind of like one of the several uh, in kernel APIs that you can use to communicate to the device. Um, once you have that, then you uh, you also have a remove function, and this may or may not be needed. If you use the the devm instructions for the allocation, it will automatically clean up. Uh, so this may or may not be uh, necessary, depending on your driver, how much data you allocate. I usually you free memory in this uh, function and, and close down any device, any device cleanup, essentially. All right, so each uh, client structure has a special field that can point to anything, essentially. And this is used for the specifics of the device itself. Um, say if it's a touchscreen controller, it would, you could store the values of the last read sample from the device. So you can say, OK, this is the uh, last x, y coordinates, and that can be stored there. It's just the internal state, essentially. And these are used to retrieve that data or store them. OK, for initialization, there are there is a special macro that they use for I squared C specifically, which I would recommend. It's the one on the bottom here. But really, it's essentially wrapping these top functions and generating them, essentially. So I squared C add driver will add your driver and register it with the system. Uh, I squared C delete driver will remove it from the system, um, but you'll notice that it's just it's just a macro template, and the I squared C driver is pretty much the one to use for most cases. Okay, so the the in kernel API is used to communicate to, to the device. So when you call these functions. It'll call back to the I squared C core, and the core will call down into the the host driver for that specific SLC that you're on. Um, so it'll um, it'll either send or receive data, and these are the ba the basic I squared C um, send and receive, and I squared C transfer, and that's just a send and receive a combination or multiple messages or sequence of bytes. Um, these are not as used as commonly as the SM bus ones. Um, so there's a set of them. And they're all kind of listed here. Uh, I'm not going to go into each one because they're, they're very kind of what you see is what you get. They're very self descriptive. Um, you a lot of times you'll be using uh, the byte functions, but sometimes you want to do a whole block of data 
It really depends on the device you're talking to. And there's another thing called RegMap, which I won't go into too much, which kind of abstracts the bus a little bit. Okay, so uh, there is a, also an interface in, in Linux that I won't get into too much, but essentially what you can do is you can have the, the Linux device emulate a peripheral, and that way another host can actually talk to it. Uh, it's commonly used for testing um, or basic communication uh, between two devices. Um, I've never really used this. I haven't found a use case for it yet, but uh, I think you can do some pretty neat things with it. Okay, so instantiating or binding uh, to the driver is required um, so that it will actually um, probe the driver when you and it, uh, when you instantiate them. So um, this is an example device tree, uh, which I don't know if there's another session on device tree, but it is kind of a hardware description that's used to uh, uh, associate the hardware with device drivers. And you'll see that the, this is a I squared C1 bus. This will depend on the host controller that you have, this there's a, a device, uh, a physical address that um, is the register mapped address of the SLC. And then you have individual devices on the bus. These are the, the uh, peripheral drivers. And those will tell you kind of specifics uh, about the device. Okay, we have an Atmel flash and an NXP GPIO controller on the bus. Uh, the register is actually the address, the bus address of the specific device. So this has to match, otherwise it will not, it will not attach to the device. Okay, in the, in the old days, they used to have this thing called platform uh, devices. Um, that's how it used to happen when I first started working on Linux. Uh, it's really just a C file that had the registrations, uh, became unmanageable and was changed eventually. Um, but yeah, for historical reasons, that's here. Okay. And you can also do binding uh, through the user space. So, if I wanted to attach to a specific bus, I can do that using the SysFS interface. And that can be useful in devices where it's, say you have a, uh, an external kind of universal connector, you wanna plug something in, and then you wanna attach the device to it. Um, the driver will be uh, bound through this uh, string that's passed into the SysFS layer for the bus. Okay. Now, there is a kind of a generic uh, I squared C bus device, which is exposed to the user space, and this is used for uh, under like development or kind of user space drivers, um, you'll have a node at slash dev I squared C X with zero through whatever, depending on the number of buses on your device. Um, you have a slave address. So there's an IO control for setting the slave address. Um, you have read and write functions. And then those, those are the standard read and write functions. So when you open the device, set the, I, I, use the IO control to set the, the address. You can start doing read and write just like you would with a normal file. But there are 
I squared C wrapper functions in user space as well. Um, and there are there's also a Python bindings for doing this as well. Um, then you have, uh, there's a utility, which I'll demonstrate, which does I squared C tools, which can detect devices on the bus and you can read and write from the, um, from the devices on the bus using uh, get and set. And these are useful during early development before you have a device driver ready or for kind of generic encapsulation of the bus. Um, Adafruit, um, I think it's called Gemma. There's a, their MicroPython wrapper for Linux essentially abstracts the bus into their libraries so that they can reuse libraries that they created for the microcontroller stuff. Um, and it's kind of a clever way of doing it, but it also is not the Linux way of doing it, but I guess both ways are, but all right. So here's, here's an, uh, an idea of what you would see when you do the LS, uh, in the dev directory for the I squared C devices, uh, you have multiple devices on this particular board. This is uh, the Pocket Beagle, which I have, I will be using for the demos. Um, and you'll notice that it has, there's a device node for each. All right, and then the I squared C detect. So what that'll do is it'll, it'll send out a, a read at, on each of the bus addresses. And then if, the, if a device responds, it'll actually put the uh, device hexadecimal um, address printed out. So if there were more than one uh, devices on the bus, it would print them in the different slots. Um, There's one of the inherent difficulties with I2C is two devices can actually have the same address and cause bus contention. So you yeah, have to watch out for that. You can't put the same device on on the bus multiple times unless the device has a way to pinstrap different addresses essentially um, and you don't necessarily have to have the same exact device to have the same exact address so you gotta watch out for that as well and this this utility will help you when you're first debugging something like that okay so this example shows you kind of an idea of how to dump register contents from a specific device um, the, using the I2C dump. Now, um, this specific device, the MMA is the accelerometer that we have on the, on the device. And it's kind of hexadecimal encoded, usually not really useful to anyone without a data sheet, but that's what you get when you do the, the dump. And this is useful if you're doing, uh, you know, basic testing um, early on. So get and set are, are individual byte read and write uh, functions. So these are used, can be used to kind of poke at the various registers within the device. Um, the MMA the device, we were probably enabling the conversion and then reading back registers to see if that it was working. Okay, so that that is the I squared C section. So we're going to go into uh, the demo. Um, I, a lot of the demo is kind of in the slides, uh, but uh, we can look at it live on a target. So let's switch over to the screen. All right. Okay. So this is the, um, can you guys, I'm sure you can see it since it's sharing. Um, let me see, we got a question here before I start. Uh, I heard about I squared C. Uh, clock stretching. Um, 
Yeah, I'd... we got a couple of questions here. 40. This screen is too small. All right. Yeah, I'd have to I'd have to go kind of this uh, clock stretching question. I would have to research that a little bit more. It's been a while since I've looked into it. Um, don't remember off the top of my head. Um, another question we have. What can we use I squared C utility to test I squared C in loopback mode? Um, there, you would only be able to do that, say you wanted to, to communicate back to from one um, host to another, that doesn't work. So loopback really wouldn't work unless you put the, if you had the capability and you drove the device into a peripheral or slave mode, and then you could loop it back. But for this, the easiest way to do testing on the bus to make sure that it's working is to go ahead and plug in pretty much any device and probe the bus to see that you see the address. And the, a loopback isn't particularly useful. Um, I squared C detect, we have another question about that. So I squared C detect just goes out to the bus and it probes the individual addresses and determines whether there's a there's a device at that specific address and prints it out. So let's let's show that on here. I squared C detect. Okay, so if you don't add the parameters, of course it'll tell you you need to do this. So I usually use dash R and dash Y and then the bus. And you can specify the first and last address that you want to probe. Uh, zero means the, the zeroth bus. Um, of course, I have to put the S squared C detect here. And what that does is it reads the bus. And for every device that it sees, that responds to an addressing it'll print it out. It's not the nicest thing to do to a bus. Sometimes this can cause grief with some control, uh, external peripherals. But, and it, it warns you about it. But on most embedded systems, it's not a problem. So then you can go to the different buses. We have three buses on this guy, zero through two. And you have one C here. That means that this device is responding and it's available and that is the on the on the particular hardware that's the accelerometer which is this little tiny chip on here but that's how detect is is used and what it's used for um for i squared c get we had a question um how to read 16 bytes data. And you can just change the mode for that. A word is 16 bytes. So that's just part of the of the pro, of the uh, utility. So say we have a, um, we wanted to do a, a word right. You just put W instead of B here. Um, that one's pretty straightforward. Um, the Python binding for, I remember we did a demo with it a couple years back. Um, let me go ahead and get you a link for that. And this will this pretty much encapsulates the I squared C dev. Um, let's see. So there's one called SMBus2, which is a Python dash SMBus2, which you can use. Let's see. 
And where's the chat window on this thing? Uh, here. On the chat window. Hopefully that comes out to everybody. Okay. Um, the, the method of changing the, the I squared C bus speed, and that's part of the, of the, the driver, essentially, um, there is a way to do it. Okay, and the demo, and that's kind of what we're doing now. So that's the last question. Um, so if we do, let's go back to our slides about the, so I can remember the commands. <laughs> uh, let's, let's do a look at the, the I squared three registers from that accelerometer. This is the range of registers you want to look at. It's the bus number. This is the bus device address. So it looks like we have something similar to what we had previously. And notice that the first uh, byte is different, and that's keep reading it. Probably not enabled yet, so go over here. Let's try doing these commands to set the it's gonna read a register. Oh, forgot to put something here. Oh the bus. So Y says to go ahead and do it, even if it's a warning. R2 is the bus. 1C is the address. And D is the, is the offset register. Okay, so we have a 3A here, or a 2A instead of a 3A. Um, let's try looking at another register like it shows in the demo okay we got a zero there um let's do a set two two a one so this is the the two a is the value and one is, or two A is the offset and one is the value. So this is probably enabling the accelerometer. Uh, we'll read back that register. And it's set. Now if we do the temp again, we start seeing data being presented in the first couple of uh, words. Um, so, yeah, we wanted to read the word. We would say why um, bus two address zero x one Charlie and the data address, which is zero, uh, and the mode, which is word and that gives you the value for the first two bytes Let's see if that changes when i when i move around the price you'll notice that it changes the value of the of that first byte this means that the device is working all right so I'd have to go into the data sheet to figure out exactly which is X, Y, and Z, uh, what exactly is going on with each one of those. Um, but we won't do that for this demo. Um, let's see if we have any other questions here. 
how does okay. yeah how does uh, arbitration work for multiple masters on the same bus? Uh, it's essentially the wild west. You have to make your own protocol. Um, usually, you can coordinate that um, through the bus, but it's it's kind of tricky. It's it's I don't think there's a specific protocol for it. Um, in most cases, you don't actually want multiple hosts on the same bus, but sometimes you might want like a, a, a side channel to the bus. Um, it, it's not going to, it's not going to damage the hardware. It's just going to follow transactions that happen at the same time. Um, because it's open collector, it's never going to contend on the bus. But yeah, uh, arbitration is is kind of tricky because there is no, I don't think there's a protocol for it. Um, the next question is, as you said, the simplest way of testing I squared C is to plug in device. Are you plugging I squared device into the bus of the Linux system? So yeah, uh, you, typically you'll have a bunch of pins that come off of the SLC and their uh, pin mux is some multiplexing. Essentially, multiple functions can do us to a single pin. What you'll do is you'll set the multiplexers so that they are in I squared C mode, enable the host controller, and then attach to those pins with the device. Now, the host controller has to be there on those pins it can't just be any set of pins but once you've done that then you can you can plug into them um typically if if there's expansion ports or a, a header that will have like a pin spec for it and they'll have the list of pin functions and then you can select i squared c function and attach to those two pins um, so that's kind of how that works um, next question is from I squared C detect output. I see the device starts at three. This is correct. Um, I think the early addresses are just never used. The spec. Yes, that's correct. My guess is there's probably a good reason for this. It, uh, if you consider the address, there, maybe the bus is stuck at a specific value and it might look like a transaction when it's not. I don't know. This is kind of You'd have to ask somebody back in the 80s when they designed the protocol or dig into the documentation a little bit, um, which is fairly difficult to find. Let's, since we have about two minutes left on the first presentation, let's kind of go back to the first uh, clock stretching thing. Oh, it looks like we had another question about SM bus. Oh, clocks. Yeah, the clock's stretching. Um, Yeah. So um, it's just a way of of slowing down or allowing the controller time to react to the uh, the previous uh, like when you when you first address the device, uh, need money time to 
think about what you just said. So it might. Uh, since the clock speed so fast, it might need a little more time so it slows down the, the clock essentially. That's what it looks like. Um, but yeah, I, I'll look into that for the next time I uh, give this presentation, which is, it's been quite a few times. All right, so let's go ahead and switch to off screen share and to the next set of slides, which is SPI. Okay. So like with I squared C, we have kind of what SPI is, example devices, different modes. Um, we have the subsystem and device drivers instantiating or attaching to the devices, uh, the user race tools and demo if we have time. Okay. So SPI stands for serial peripheral interface and it's a full duplex synchronous serial. Um, they call it master slave, but there's been some recent controversy about this because it's of the casual slavery uh, mentions. So they might start renaming things in data sheets. We'll see, and, and I'll update this as those come in. Um, so it's a de facto standard, so it's not really a standard. Um, uh, developed in 1980s again by Motorola. Um, so each bus consists of a single master or host device and multiple slaves or peripherals. Peripherals is probably the new preferred language. Um, and then there's a, there's a set of IO lines that are used to communicate to devices on the bus. Uh, there's a, a clock line, usually denoted S clock or SCK. There's the MISA line, master and slave out. I think that the new terminology is controller and peripheral. I don't remember. There are, there's sometimes called, this is sometimes called SDA. There's a bunch of different ways of annotating it, but MISO is the most um, clear. Um, then you have MOSI, which means master out, slave in. So those are just single direction lines. And you can see by the, the little picture over here uh, how that kind of works. And then there's a chip select. And that does is it, it says, oh, I want to talk to this specific device. There's no addressing over the bus. It's just a, a line that toggles. And sometimes you'll have a, uh, an IRQ. This uh, is particularly useful for input devices or devices that need to trigger events. Um, there are also uh, cases where you'll need to register a GPIO to enable specific functionality. Um, like with a TFT, spy tft there's sometimes you'll need to toggle a, a an io line it's not spi specific but sometimes you'll have to bind that with the driver um, so here's kind of a, a top level view of what it would look like on on the hardware side so you have the, the host controller and then the the peripherals on the right hand side each one has its own chip select and the, the master out goes to the slave in. So that's kind of how it works. And here's a, a few examples of devices that you would see out in the real world. So analog converters are very common use case. 
Uh, sensors are also very common. So this, these are, you're gonna see a lot of that with your IoT devices, uh, inertial or temperature, pressure, humidity. Um, there, there's a sensor for everything. So, and the lower bandwidth ones uh, usually use I squared C. Uh, and then, you know, you can do, um, or higher speed ones will go SPI. And, and you can use, there's some that actually use both, which complicates the hardware a little bit, but yeah. Touchscreen controllers, FPGA programming, that ICE40 FPGA actually has a, an SPI bus that's used to program it. Um, it's an interesting use case. And over here we have uh, the hardware that's on the, on this device, which is, uh, we're emulating a seven segment um, LED with a GPIO controller. Um, so, okay. So there, are, there are a few modes for SBIs, which are, which determine the, the, the way that the clock and data lines inter interact and the, the two, um, parameters are polarity and phase. So C, C pole and C phi or phase. And for each device, they'll have a specific mode, which will tell you how it's going to, how it's going to react. And this, uh, C pole clock polarity, if it's set to zero, that means the clock will idle low and it's set to one, it'll idle high. And that means just outside of the chip select window. We'll show you examples of this. And the phase is just determines what edge the uh, of the clock that the data is latched on and transitioned. So uh, what happens is it, it uses both edges of the clock for SPI. And I'll, I'll explain that with the timing diagrams. Um, but then the modes are represented by a tuple and or the encoded form. Okay, so let's go through the different modes. Uh, if we set the polarity to zero, that means that uh, the rising edge is used to latch the data and the tra trailing edge is used to transition. So the data is latched on the rising edge, but if you set the pole to one, it does, it idles low still, but then the data is latched on the falling edge. So the falling edge of the clock is, is this uh, transition from, from one to zero or high to low. And you'll notice it's in the middle of the of the, the MOSI. Um, so that just tells you how the, the, the data is transferred, um, how it's shifted along. Okay, and then for polarity one, you'll notice that the clock here is on, it's settling high outside of the chip select window. This chip select window is this here on the bottom. So that's essentially enabling the device. And then the clock transitions are opposite. So you'll still on the, the, uh, uh, the trailing edge or the falling edge, it'll latch and it'll transition on the rising edge. And then if it's mode three, which means that both the pole and the phase are set, mm -hmm. This is kind of the tiger timing diagram for that. And you'll notice that it it latches on the rising edge here. So it really depends on the device you're talking to, which mode it uses, and it will typically tell you in the data sheet. But if it doesn't, you can look at the timing diagrams and try to match them up. And some devices will work with multiple modes. It's just a matter of figuring out what works best. Okay, so let's go into the the Linux subsystem a little bit here. Uh, it was 
again, developed in the early 2000s um, in the transition from 2.5 to 2.6. Um, there are a lot of uh, developers that were involved. Um, and we have only a few maintainers have held the subsystem so far. Um, Mark Brown is the, is the current maintainer. Um, I think his nickname is Bruni. Okay. Um, here's the mailing list. So if you're wanting to write a device driver for a host controller, you would go onto this list and uh, submit patches. If you wanted to submit a driver for a specific peripheral, you would figure out which subsystem the peripheral resides in and then send it to that mailing list. And it's usually, um, it's all over the place. There's so many different subsystems that use these core drivers. Um, so, uh, we'll talk a little bit about controller drivers, which are the, the host side. So they, they kind of abstract and drive transactions and the, there's an SPI core, just like there was an I squared C core that it communicates to. Um, then you have callbacks that are used to do, uh, by the core driver to drive the transactions. Um, there is a, a struct spy controller, which is a, it's a fairly large struct that is used with all the different parameters and uh, callback functions. Okay. So here's kind of the basic flow for creating a host driver. So the first thing you wanna do is allocate the, the master with the spy master function. And then you go ahead and set the, the controller fields. Um, there are a bunch of different flags for bit modes. Um, then you have the uh, callback functions uh, for setup and uh, cleanup. Um, then you can choose whether you want to use transfer one message or transfer one uh, callback and it, the implementation really depends on the uh, the host driver, which which is easier. I think the the transfer one message is used more commonly. And then you register the controller using spy register master. Okay. Well, we'll talk a little bit about device tree binding. Um, so for each device that you want to add to a bus, you'll have a chip select that's associated with that. And those can either be the native chip selects, which are defined by the host, or you, uh, in some cases you can use GPIO chip selects to override and use. And if you want to use a mix of the two, you can actually use, if you put zero in that field that de determines that chip select one, zero one, is actually using the native chip select. Um, and this implementation of this is different for each board, but GPIO chip selects are useful for when you can't have, either you can't access the native line because it's covered by another function, or you want to have more chip selects on your bus. Okay. So here's an example uh, device tree binding for a host controller. And this is a TI one. You'll notice that it has so the, the register map, you know, uh, each device will have a different address here. Um, that just the memory or uh, the memory mapped IO space where that controller is residing is very specific. Um, then you have the number of chip selects. Uh, you typically have to pass DMA 
um, channels for the device so that it doesn't bog down the system when you're doing transactions, uh, long transactions. Um, and that kind of just automatically kind of happens uh, in the background. You got your status equals disabled. And that What that means is the device is going to be disabled by default. And they do this on the top level or the, um, the DTSI files. So the top level will include this uh, DTSI file. And then if you want to use that specific peripheral, you'll set the status to OK. And then you'll attach devices to it. And we'll show you that further down in the uh, presentation. All right, so protocol drivers are the drivers that most people are interested in because that's when you're interfacing with the device external. Um, so for each one you intend on accessing, you have a protocol driver and uh, they're uh, spread out through multiple subsystems as explained earlier. The common ones are IIO or industrial IO, input MTD, which is flash. Um, mess messages and transfers are used to communicate to the to devices and are, are kind of directed through the controller through the ICE or the SPI core to the device. So this kind of happens in the background and they abstracted it so that it makes it a little easier for device development, device drivers. Um, there's a spy device struct that is passed the probe and remove functions. And this is kind of where you, you know, the magic happens. All right, so there's kind of two, two terms for the, the messages or transfers, uh, kind of sequences of bytes that are going to and from the, uh, the devices. So transfer is a single operation and there are TX and RX buffers because it's a, full duplex, you need to have buffers for both. Uh, a lot of devices won't communicate at the same time on the TX or the MISO, MISO and MOSI, but it's something that can happen. So you have to have two buffers. Um, the chip select behavior, there's some, sometimes you don't want the chip select to toggle between transfers. So you have to set uh, certain flags and you can set delays after the chip select, or there's a lot of different parameters that you can set depending on the needs of the device. And then there's messages, which is just a sequence of transfers. And usually this is what you use for your driver. Okay, so we're gonna look at this, uh, the spy device uh, struct. Um, so there's a lot of different fields in here. There's the uh, there's always advice. Uh, then you have the the controller, the master, uh, various parameters for that specific bus um, or device, and then you know uh, the controller state. A little different fields in there. Okay, and here's if you look back here. You have some, the mode can be set with these macros. So that this is how you set the phase and polarity. And you see that they have the chips like modes, which are combinations of those two. Uh, the byte ordering, whether you want to do uh, multiple um, data lines out and this is a, a special use case, a quad or dual spy. Um, quad spy is pretty common. Dual spy, not so much. Okay. So in your probe function, you have you 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 have your own chips or your own struct which contains the data you need for your driver, and then your platform data 
And then oh, uh, we have an open firmware uh, device match. So when the probe happens, uh, this o open firmware device match is used to attach to a specific um, device or um, binding. And then you have an allocation for the driver state, typically. And you can set that into your, using your set drive data and set that into there. And then any functions that are used in the driver and you need that data, you would use the get function. Okay. And then you'd have um, kind of an open firmware match table. So this is the compatible string for your device. Um, and sometimes you'll need data uh, depending on the device. This is usually, it's particularly useful for devices that are device drivers that control multiple um, different types of um, IC. So you would have, say you had an, an ADC driver, but the core of that driver is common amongst all like maybe five or six different um, devices then you can use the same driver and this data can be used to uh, distinguish between them and change the behavior subtly depending on the specific chip that you're using and i i can probably show you that with um, industrial i always probably got a good example um, then you have the spy table, which is a, is registered. And you have the driver struct, and this is where you pass the functions pointers. So uh, the probe, remove, shut down. And I'll have an example of that: the ID table and the uh, device driver. Okay, so here's an example of that. You would pass. The name, uh, PM is power management, and this is optional. Uh, but if sometimes when you go into low power modes, you want to change the state of the, the device to put it into its own low power mode, then this is useful. Um, the open firmware table uh, is just a pointer back to that table, which determines what devices can be attached to this driver. You have the probe, probe function is important. And then you have the ID table, which is kind of like a spy specific ID table. And it's used for different type of binding. Okay. So, well, let's get into the kernel APIs that are used in your driver. Um, and these are the basic ones, uh, spy async, spy sync, spy read, and spy write. And these are essentially used to send messages um, to and from the device or simultaneously since it's full duplex. And async is uh, can only be issued or can it be issued in any context and this is synchronous one can only happen in an on sleep or uh, an on sleep context or not an IRQ so or, um, or in a sleep context which means that it can happen in an IRQ context so and it makes spy drivers a little tricky sometimes and the thing is that those transactions take too long to happen in an IRQ context. So you really don't want to do that anyways. So you have a bottom half to handle that essentially. Um, and then the spy read and write are pretty self-explanatory, but they're kind of wrapper functions. There's some more specific ones. Uh, spy, uh, spy flash read or read flash is a, uh, for uh, SPI flash commands. Uh, this is usually 
all encapsulated in the MTD layer. So um, you could probably find examples of that there. Um, uh, spy message in it. So this is initializes a message and then uh, it, it's just a struct that it fills in. And then you have the transfers. So you add transfers or messages to the, to the transfer using this function. Um, I think there's an example of this somewhere in the further down on the slides. Okay. So the binding or instantiating devices, you can use a bunch of different modes or um, um, methods. And the, the device tree is most commonly used. Um, so for each node, there's, so like every controller has a series of chip selects and that underneath that you can set the different uh, devices that are attached to those chip selects. Um, the compatible string will tell you which driver it attaches to through that firmware binding or the uh, interface. Um, register is kind of the, ch uh, the chip select number. So it, it'll determine which one of the controller chip selects to use. And then the maximum frequency is kind of like an upper bound on the frequency for that specific device. And this is really determined by the device. So you want to set an upper bound so the controller doesn't go over that. And the controller is never going to hit that exact frequency though, because it's using, using a prescaler. So it'll be something lower than that maximum frequency that you can set it to. Okay. And these are some different like uh, bit fields or flags that you can set in the device tree to set the um, the polarity, the phase, the chip select high. This is a an odd use case because uh, it really kind of messes up the bus. But sometimes there are devices that want the chip select to go high instead of low, and uh, that flag can be used to, to set that. Um, you can't have other devices that are uh, chip select low or well, they, there's ways around it, but it's, it, it makes, it complicates things. And then you can set the, uh, bus width. So always are typically one by default. And then you have the delays and those are all kind of corresponding with, uh, the information from earlier in the host. Okay, so here's an example of instantiating a, a node. So you have underneath the SPY1 here. So the SPY1 is defined previously. You're adding the you're adding the status OK. You're setting the pin control. So what this does is it changes the multiplexing so that those spin or SPY pins are connected properly. And then you have uh, your spy max frequency and your different parameters. And then you have register zero, which means chip select zero. And you also have the at zero, which is kind of like a designation. All right. So uh, platform registration is the old way of doing it. Um, so there's that, an example. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Not that you will be doing this with pretty much any modern system. All right, so let's let's uh, look at the user space utilities. Um, SpyDev is essentially a universal driver that abstracts the the core driver or the host driver. And it allows you to connect to pretty much any device from user space and make kind of user space drivers. Um, so you pass data, you have buffers and you hand it off to the host driver and it does its magic.
and then it'll it'll return back from from kernel space into user with the results of the transaction. Okay, so we like to kind of give you the do's and don'ts with SpyDev because there's a particularly kind of sticking point is like the the maintainer of of the Spy subsystem doesn't encourage the use of this, but a lot of um, Hobbyists will intent, will use it and will kind of give you the use cases where it's useful and should be used, and then the ones where it shouldn't be. Uh, prototyping underlined. Um, this is a good time to use SpyDev so you can figure things out. Um, yeah, it's just a good time like to to do that, and then. Um, simple protocols or talking to a microcontrollers as uh, something that you would never end up putting as a mainline driver, but you could also use an out of tree driver or module. Um, it really depends on what you need. Um, but if it's a very simple protocol and it doesn't need any interrupts or anything fancy, then you could probably end up, you can probably use SPI dev. And when you shouldn't use it, of course, if there's a driver, don't don't use SpyDev. Use the driver. If if you have to write a driver and you're dragging your feet, just write the driver. Um, especially if it needs to do IRQ handling, it just it makes more sense. Um, things that aren't accessible to user space easily, like interrupts. Um, yeah, you, you want to do this in the kernel. Not using SpyDev. Okay. So uh, SpyDev has a set of functions um, uh, using IO control and read and write access is is possible, but you usually end up using IO control for the transfer as well. Um, here's a list of headers that are required. Uh, the most important one is the, the Linux slash spy slash spy dev dot H, which will give you the list of IO controls. Okay. And the SysFS node for spy will include the uh, the spy device child nodes, and for each spy uh, chip select, you'll have a dev entry. You'll have a, a sysfs a sys devices entry, and you'll have a sys class uh, spy dev entry if it's bound to spy dev. So the, the, those are the different user accessible interfaces. The important one is the character device, which is what you'll be communicating with, um, with a, like a standard C program or wrapper library. Okay. So the open and close are just like normal. You open the device and then you can do read and write, but they're half duplex, and you um, you can't do crazy transactions that require uh, full duplex. Um, then there's a IOC, IOC message, spy IOC message, um, IO control that's used for that. I think I have an example of this. Okay. Uh, we're going to go through the different I.O. controls that you can use. So you can set the modes, um, read or write mode, depending on. So if you need to set the the uh, polarity or the phase dynamically, you can do that with these. Okay. And then you can change the, um, the LSB 
orientation and the read bits and write bits per word. This is usually eight, but it can be more. And the max speed, you can set that as well. And this allows you to kind of make like um, modify parameters in the kernel using the IO control to set up the controller. Okay. So here's the basic idea. You have a, a couple of buffers and those buffers are pointed to by a transfer struct and then you have a delay and a length and that, that'll change depending on how many bytes you want to send. Um, then you open the device and then you perform this spy IOC message. I, I'm glazing over like any modification of the phase and polar polarity, but this is the basic operation. Um, I have a, t a test program that I created a while back, which is linked below, which kind of allows you to, I think, um, send device or send uh, a message across the spy dev interface. And this is particularly useful for testing. All right, so that gets us to demo slash question area. And it looks like we have plenty of time. Um, if we have any new questions. It's like nothing new with the SPI. Um, so let's switch over to screen share. Okay. So this particular device, uh, probably have, it looks like I have the wrong SD card in here. Um, let's look at the, uh, if we have the spy dev nodes or not CD. Okay. So it looks like we have spy dev zero, one, spy dev one, zero. So we have two devices registered on the system. So if we went into the uh, sys yes. I have You have those devices here. Points back to the platform. And this will give you some information about the device. Okay. I don't know if I have the utility plugged in here though. This might make the demo difficult. Um, typically, we just demonstrate the uh, the LEDs on the board using the spy interface, but I don't have the right SD card in there. Um, so, how do I want to do this? Let's see. So instead of going into live demo mode, 
we'll look at drivers. <laughs> um, okay. So, as stated earlier, there's a SPI subsystem. Okay. And in this directory, you have all the different host controller drivers, um, most commonly used. Uh, part of this is the spy.c, which is the core. And then the rest is kind of like specifics for the controller that you're using. Uh, there's the SpyDev interface. Um, let's look at the OMAP driver, which is the one we have here. Ooh. OMAP2 mix by. Okay. And there's going to be a lot of like controller specifics in this. This is your device specific struct. That's the name of the driver as well, apparently. But uh, here's an example of the platform uh, driver registration. Here's the example of retrieving the, the device data, the dev data. Okay. okay. Here you see it's filling in all of all of the parameters for the specific device callback functions. And you can see that these are some of the more uh, this is a setting for the candy MA transfer one. So this is the transfer function callback. That's and this does the specifics for that controller. And it's not necessarily a simple example, but you get an idea. How it works. Let's see. And set the frequencies, uh, min to max Our message. Setup function it's used to set up a transfer. Okay. Then not really exciting, but sometime, someday you may need to implement that. Most of the time, you have a, a, a device driver. And depending on the subsystem, I think for this specific device, we're using a GPIO controller. So, these are the different GPIO controllers that are available. And it has a core just like the other two subsystems. I don't want to do that. Drawing a blank here. Let's go back. <laughs> 
MCP 23. It must have moved it. Um, Moved into pin control. Okay. This is the device driver for this controller that's on the board. I wonder if I have that. So, of course, this is one of those drivers where you have both I squared C and SPI. Makes it more complicated. But then there's a SPI in it. And then you have a SPI register device, which was mentioned earlier, which calls or passes the pointer to the SPI driver struct has the different functions uh, uh, structs pointed to. So this is the probe function. And you'll notice here, you have the open firmware match, the platform data, fills out the platform data. And then it parses some specific flags for the driver from the device tree here. And then it has the per instance allocation, sets the driver data. And does the probe for the individual devices. And then we have the different IDs. So this is different devices that can be attached. So that's kind of like a basic um, SPI driver. So um, I guess I'll just open it up for questions now because I kind of botched my demo and forgot the SD card. Um, I might be able to pull down my demo from GitHub and use it, but I don't know that I have the right registration here for SpyDev. Um, let's just do this. Mm. The messages, just the kernel messages for the board. Let's see if it's got any SPI devices registered here. I guess another way to do it is just to see. Okay. So we have three. Um, and here's our drivers. Ah, I know why this is, I know why this, this is set up for a silly demo um, to run Doom on the Pocket Beagle. Um, and so it's got a spy TFT and that's what the, uh, that's what it's rigged for. Um, I don't, it doesn't seem like a very good demo for this though. <laughs> um, 
So let's just go back to the slides and see if we have any questions. Oh, we got three pages. Okay, so we got a question from Key Rock Lee. How do you know the offset? And I'm guessing that is the offset uh, of the I squared C transaction. Uh, that depends on the data sheet. So the register offset will be described in the data sheet. Um, and, and the UU in the detect means that there's a um, device that's already, or a driver that's already attached to it. Um, let's see. Where do I get the 00 through 31 on? So that's, that is just the, a list of register addresses. It's just all of them essentially. Um, can you give quick, some quick pointers on how to leverage the interrupt pin on a slave device? Okay. So when you, when you um, create the driver, you'll register an interrupt in the probe function. And let's see if we can find a good example of that. This, I think that driver should have an interrupt. So, is the interrupt callback? Okay. During the setup, you can register an, an IRQ, and there's different ways to do this, but uh, this is one of them a threaded IRQ. And the, R, the IRQ. We go. So you're reading. This is essentially what this is doing in this specific example is it, it's a, a chained IRQ or a threaded IRQ. So the GPIOs can actually trigger, it, the, all of them can trigger an IRQ essentially. So it's a little more complicated than you usually have but then there's an irq that goes back to the main device and i'm guessing i don't know this has probably happened during the i squared c um, portion of it but uh, it's kind of the same thing you let's see if we have a better example here There's a lot of them. Let's look at this one. It's, luckily, it is a spy device. Um, but you'll register an IRQ. Okay. That's not a very good example. But yes, there's the same thing, the request threaded IRQ here. Driver one shot. So you you pass the, the IRQ through the, the registration and it passes it to the to the core and then the core passes it to the driver. Okay, so we have a little, just a little bit of time left. So I'm going to try and bang out all these questions. Um, so user space command to change bus frequencies. Um, I don't know. I don't think so off the top of my head. Um, I think it's a configuration thing in the 
binding. And it's really controller specific, whether it can do it or not. Um, looks like we had another question about IRQ. Um, which kind of covered uh, what situation uh, do, device support both. Okay. So device driver can support both or a device can support both. Um, it, and uh, ones that I've seen, like I've seen a touch screen controller driver that has both I squared C and SPI versions, but the core functionality is nearly identical. Um, sometimes the device can be pinstrapped into either mode depending on the, the the levels on certain lines it'll to put it into certain modes i've seen that with audio codecs so yeah there's a bunch of different situations where both are supported either on hardware or in the software side um is there a reason for choosing different modes and this is the controller or the device specific so if there's a device, two devices on the bus, and one uses a slightly different mode. You have to be able to set it so uh, that you can't just use it one for everything. There are some in some cases where the two uh, the modes have to be different, essentially. There, uh, for uh, there is by slave mode for Linux, I believe, but it is less used and it's, it's not not all that commonly used, but it is available. Um, the controller tree binding of SPY, only master details presence, but without device, what the use of the... Um, so uh, when you register the, the host, it's kind of on its own and then you override it with the top level DTS file, which attaches the devices or the slaves. There's a lot of questions. Probably should have looked at these before. I... Um, the spy dev is a loadable module. Yes. Um, Does by slave device talk with user space driver? What's the difference between slave driver and spy dev driver? So um, spy dev is a, a, a generic slave driver essentially, and it it just it doesn't encode any of the protocol. It just passes through the protocol from user space. Um, we get another inner question. Uh, is it possible to connect FPGA in Beagleball and Blue using SPY? Um, it, sh it should be. <laughs> uh, I, I designed a board called BeagleWire, which is an FPGA cape for the uh, Beagleball block. So it says it, I cannot see your screen. I didn't see that earlier. Um, was was the screen share going the whole time? Okay, so maybe somebody had a bad feed. Yeah, and the slides are the slides are available uh, on the SCED, um, and then they're also on the ELC site, so they're all available for the person who's asking for them. I think that, that does it for all the questions. Um, anybody want to throw one last one in? Nope. Looks like it's wrap up time. Okay.
So I guess that's it for today. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I'm sorry about the demos. Um, I should have double checked my SD card and I didn't want to shuffle around and look for it while I was on the camera. So um, that does it. Thank you for joining my presentation.